put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. But hey, if the video is just too long for you to watch, chances are I recorded a shorter version and the link will be in the description box. It's not an inferior video, it's merely a Cliff's Notes version of this very video. Until superfluous origins, PlayStation 2 port, game review. Travis Grady is a trucker, or at least I think he's supposed to be, but dude thinks like you would not believe. I'd say maybe a third of the cutscenes involve him passing out and or getting back to his feet, waking up, stuff like that. Anyway, he takes a shortcut through Silent Hill, presumably because he doesn't know this game series, and he almost hits something yet. Yeah, stop me if you've heard this one before. Anyway, he gets out of his truck, finds a young girl in blue suit, I don't know exactly what to call it, and soon after he is at a burning house with Dahlia standing outside, sporting a snazzy looking fur coat. And if you've played the first game, you know exactly what the deal is with the burning house. Now, the burning house is actually one of the things about this game. You know that really awesome level in the first Max Payne game where you are in this building and suddenly there's just a fire starting and you just have to run around, find your way, if you stand still for like a second, you'll die from, you know, you'll burn to death. And it's just really intense and you didn't see it coming. The game really throws you for a loop. Yeah, this is nothing like that. It's, it, it really sets the tone because right off the bat, I am just violently disinterested in what's going on. And I really shouldn't be because I love this series. And it, the first game in particular, the first three games in slightly different ways, but the first game especially, I think in part it's the kind of meh graphics on the flames, the fact that there really is no rush in this sequence, and just we know what's going to happen. This is one of the most unnecessary prequels I have ever encountered. This did not need to exist. It's a prequel to the first game and it really doesn't tell you anything that we didn't already know, or at least surmised from the first game. It shows you one or two things that we only surmised before, but we didn't need to see them. It's not compelling at all to get this further chapter set seven years prior to the events of the first game. What is reasonably compelling is the actual story of Travis, because as is usual for this franchise, it delves into the psyche of the person, of, of the protagonist. And that really, really helps here because otherwise there would be no reason. Travis has no connection basically to the events of the first game. Yeah, I, I think I'll just let it 
I won't say anything more about that, because if you've played the first game, you know exactly what I'm talking about, and if you haven't, I really don't want to spoil it. Go play the first game instead. I'm trying to figure out what I'm saying with that. But yeah, it really feels like they had this fairly interesting story about a trucker, and they just figured, hey, let's combine it with the story of the first game. Utterly unnecessary. And it really feels... You can see the stitches. Or the staples, I should say. <sighs> Playing this game is not unlike trying to play through the first game, because in ways you could almost call it a remake, with a busted joystick, a cataract, and someone bumping into you at random intervals, causing you to utterly lose your... Yeah, screwed that one up, didn't I? Disorienting you is what I'm getting at. I will expand more on those points, but first I really should say the good, because as bad as this game is, there is good to it. I already mentioned the story, and it, it really feels like a Silent Hill story. In a lot of ways, this does feel like a... It, it is a Silent Hill experience, it's just not up to par. It's definitely the worst of these games. Anyway, staying on the positives for now. The music, and in general sound, is still fantastic. It really has this creepy, disturbing vibe to it throughout. I, I can't say too much more about the music, I'm really not fluent in that, but the sounds... I think giving examples might really help. There, there's this bit where you're, you're near some trees and some, you know, minor forestation, and you just hear these noises like something's rustling in leaves, and, and you just feel like at any moment something's going to jump out of this foliage and attack me. It, it taps into that primal fear that there is something out to get me. I just can't see it right now, but it's right, it's, it's right there and it is after me specifically. And it, it just does that phenomenally well. The, the town of Silent Hill is yet again slightly abandoned, and it feels like someone was here not terribly long ago, but it still has that feel of isolation. It's, it's not comfortable to be where people haven't been for a, for a long time. It feels very disconcerting to us. We, we want to be around other people. We wonder why there isn't people around, and it is clear that it's not like people moved out. We're not talking completely empty houses. We're talking abandoned. There are still plates. There, there are uh, what's, ashtrays with half cigarettes. Where did these people go, is what you're thinking. And then you have the other world of loud, disconcerting noises. That's where the music really kicks into this just, you, you hear something banging, metal banging on metal. You just, you want to get out of there. It's, it's, it's just, yeah. And you, you have rusty metal grating for floors with holes in the floor that seemingly, seemingly endless drops downwards and just rotted, walls and everything. The monsters continue to be very disturbing, these grotesque creatures. Again, examples is probably best. 
There are a few that we already know of, which is a little disappointing, but it does have several that are unique to this game. Or at least, d did not appear before this game. We have this thing called the two-back, which is like two skinless people melted together. It's really, really creepy. Looks like something out of a, uh, David Cronenberg or d d possibly The Thing, kind of, d d yeah. And no dogs, somehow. I did not know that it was possible to make a game of this, of, of the survival horror subgenre without any dogs for enemies. And these various, there, there are several really huge enemies that just slowly lumber. And you have this, there's this thing that is basically a roadkill, and it like leaps out. And it, it's like, it's, you, you can literally see where the, the neck was run over by a tire. It's, it's like broken and thinner than the rest of the body. And it's just really, really, and, and by the way, I think it's supposed to be like an ox or a cow, something like that. So, yeah, something that would maybe, I guess something Travis might have run over, actually. The various, the puzzles are definitely a plus. That is something, I don't know about Downpour, but this is like the only game, a Silent Hill game, with puzzles this side of, you know, number four. Seriously. Homecoming, next to no real puzzles. And you know, Shattered Memories, it's just motion control based. You just have to move things around. Open stuff, most of the time. This genuine, legitimate puzzles. You really have to think to solve these. That is what I like to see. The various areas and the way you, you know, it's, it's the basic practice of you, you move into a new area, you try to find a map as early as you can, and then you move around trying out doors. Sooner or later you're going to find a clue leading you to the next area, then you solve a puzzle going on to the next, and so on and so forth. And this does go into a few new areas. For a while, I didn't think it was going to, because again, at times this feels like a remake of the first. You go to several of the same areas, and it's just not very interesting. I mean, several of these games actually have you going to Silent Hill, but at least they have you going to different places of Silent Hill. Or it looks fairly different, excuse me, as with Shattered Memories. And I think that might pretty well. I suppose the length isn't bad. This took me 12 and a half hours of real time, nine and a half hours of in-game time to actually complete, which is more than twice of what it took me to complete Shattered Memories. And for reference, Shattered Memories, I did not rush through basically at all, except maybe the nightmare sequences. This I rushed through from start to finish, and that brings us nicely into the bad. <sighs> right from the start, this is just a game that doesn't, it kind of turns me off right off the bat. I, I already talked about the burning house. And yeah, then it has you go into these same areas as the first. And then, after a fairly slow and comfortable opening, well, comfortable is maybe comfortable for a survival horror game, with not that many enemies, not that much fighting, it suddenly starts just pouring on the monsters, and it just keeps going. For the rest of the game, it just 
if every time you every time you make progress, especially when you finish an area and then you have to move on to the next area, the streets of Silent Hill are freaking. We're talking a war zone in this game. I mean, they were. There have there there has been this gradual increase in how tough enemies were and how many of them there were and stuff like that in the various games, you know, and Homecoming was very, very much an action game. This is just, I mean, I, I for as difficult as Homecoming got, it never had me rushing through the entire yeah, I. Th this is the only one where I really just consistently rushed through. The room I started rushing through, the last bit because it started to really frustrate me. Also with the enemies, but yeah, this one just from start to finish. The, the the thing with the enemies about them just pouring them on. I think what happened, or at least what it seems like happened here is that they were afraid that this game wouldn't be challenging enough. Mind you, this has no difficulty settings, no choice of difficulty settings. There is apparently only one, I don't know if, I haven't, I've only played through the game once yet, so I don't know if it's going to be even more difficult on the replay as at least was the case with the first one. Anyway, you, you don't get to choose if it should be easier or not. I think they just, they were afraid that it wouldn't be challenging enough and so they did various different things that would all make the game more challenging by themselves and cum the, the cumulative effect is that it's just insane. This is the kind of game where it would really have been fitting for it to allow you to save any time. I, I was reminded of Nocturne during this game, and you probably don't even know what that game is, but that is also fairly difficult, and there are certainly a lot of monsters but that game also spoon feeds you ammunition and you can save at any time. And the other sort of main big point of comparison between the two games is that both of them have the fixed angle where Nocturne pretty much has it throughout. Just there, are, I, I'm not sure there's a single dynamic camera in a moving single moving camera in all of Nocturne. This does have moving cameras, but a lot of the time you have this fixed camera, and certainly you do not have control of the camera. There's a center view function, but it might actually hurt more than help. It it basically doesn't work properly, and it throws off your idea of where you are in the room. In, instead of going behind Travis, which is what we're asking it to do, the camera, it might go to the side of him. Like, say it might start out on the left side of him, and then you press center view, and it goes to the right side of him. And it just completely throws you out of... You know, I, I had to check the map so many times just to figure out where am I pointing, where am I directed. And keep in mind, this happens when you're fighting enemies. You lose track of if, you're, if your back is turned to an enemy or if you're facing them. It Literally, if you are trying to shoot an enemy and then he closes in and you try to run away, the camera might suddenly change and suddenly you don't really know where you are in relation to the enemy. And the... Frankly, the angles, a lot of the time they hide the enemies, sometimes even keeping you from seeing where you are. 
I lost count of how many times Travis was obscured by something and the camera still didn't change. And then the other big thing with the with the camera. When you when when the camera changes, it changes unexpectedly and because the because you like in the fourth game, the room, you if you press right, your character will move right. He won't turn right or strafe right. He will just go right. And the same with the other directional the other directions. So if the camera suddenly changes to a different angle and you and and you're moving, which you probably are, it's going to throw off your angle. You're suddenly a bunch of the time. And this happened in fact, I think the first time it happened was right after I started the game, right as Travis is moving away from his truck, suddenly he turned and ran back because the camera changes to this awkward angle where suddenly the direction you were supposed to be going in is the opposite of the direction you were supposed to be going in. I did not know that games were still doing that. Frankly, I was a little surprised that it happened in the room as well. I, kind of thought that that was the thing that stopped, you know, on the other side of the turn of the millennium. But anyway, this makes it further more difficult. And in a really lousy way, it's the kind of thing where it's not because the enemies are challenging, which they are, or that you have little to fight with, which you do, it's that you can't even tell where the enemy is and if you are hitting them or not some of the time. The... On, on weaponry, the... The melee weapons now break, and they break over nothing. Like, you might be able to take out two enemies and then what the, the weapon you were carrying breaks. And don't worry, there are more. There are plenty. You, it's one of the common items to find now, another breakable melee weapon. And this idea in itself is fine. I absolutely love it in games like System Shock 2, but in that game, you can fix the weapons. You can you, you have to maintain them so they don't break. Or you might eventually have to just dump that weapon. And in this, Travis defaults back to his fists if you're fighting and your weapon breaks. And when else would it break? It's not like you can toss the ones that are practically broken away either, by the way. You can't tell if a weapon is breaking or not. But, yeah, and so in, instead of having, like, I, I don't know why it doesn't just have a button that says grab the next melee weapon. Arm yourself with that. It has a quick inventory to cycle through the melee weapons and such. More on that in a few seconds. Anyway, the one of the real problems with this, the weapons breaking, is that you are picking up different ones. It's not like the same. There, there's like a dozen, at least, different melee weapons in this game, and so when one breaks, you might be moving on to an, a new one, which you don't even know how it works. So, yeah, either you just do the trial by fire thing, or you spend an inordinate amount of time playing this game, just attacking the air, so you know how that weapon works when you get around to using it. 
And the quick inventory, the big problem with that, the reason you can't just use the quick inventory to arm your next melee weapon, is that for some reason they chose to combine the weapon categories of melee and throwable. Yes, there are throwable weapons in this game. And instead of having them in a separate category, the same as the firearms, if, if you press up on your D-pad, is that what it's called? Then it will change categories, and they only kept it to two firearms and everything else. Instead of just making it three, it doesn't take that long to switch between categories. This would have been so easy for them to do. But yeah, throwable. So you have to cycle through the throwables that you're not using if you want to get to the melee weapon. Well, I suppose you could just throw away the throwables and stop picking them up, I, I suppose. But still, it would have been so easy for them to just fix this. What are throwables? They are items of a decent weight. Again, there's at least a dozen different types. They range from toaster, filing cabinet, just heavy stuff that you can throw. And yeah, basically it's, it's a one-use weapon where you throw it at an enemy hoping he doesn't move out of the way, or you know, hope, hoping he doesn't move suddenly and in a different direction so you don't hit him and hoping that the camera allows you to line up your shot because it usually doesn't. The... This is a port for the PS2 of the PSP game, I think, and from what I hear, the PSP game is a little better. It doesn't have the bugs that I'm going to go into now, at least. Let's start with the minor ones. Sound and music suddenly stops. Just stops in a, in a room, and then when you enter another room, it might start up again. And this is not part of the game, this just... Yeah. And it, it takes you out of it. It ruins the illusion, of course. And the, yeah, I think that's it for the minor ones. The more impactful, more frustrating, is that there is a lag on several functions, such as bringing up the map, pausing, and bringing up the inventory. This might not sound like much of an inconvenience, but what you have to remember is sometimes bringing up the, especially the inventory, might be something that you're doing in the middle of a fight. And every single moment counts in a fight, especially a boss match, which again is very likely to be where you are doing this, because Reloading in the inventory is much safer than reloading in the game. And so if you were fighting a boss, you're trying to reload, you press the button and it doesn't react right away, you get hit because you were expecting it to go into the inventory and you didn't know to move out of the way. And this just happens a ton. And it happens on occasion in puzzles and the like, the final puzzle I got so frustrated with because for some reason it, it was, it barely responded to what, what I was doing to solve the puzzle. And basically I ended up just having to jiggle the What's it called? Directional thing. The directional stick. Whilst pressing the button that I was supposed to, and just eventually it would work out. 
it, it worked out. I got through the puzzle, but it's just... I, I... Did they not test for this stuff? It feels like you're playing a beta version or something, where they don't have all the kinks worked out. And I suppose that pretty well covers it. Yeah, just utterly redundant. Very, very poor in some major, very important respects. And definitely the worst of the series, whilst not completely without value. I've reviewed other parts of this series, the links are in the description box. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.